Welcome to Berlin. I'm super impressed. I have to say, we were very worried, and I remember Kilian's look on his face last year when I announced we would be having this this year in Berlin. He's like, Berlin? Berlin? That's me. I'm all alone. And then we hired another person in Berlin, Tobias, and those two just pulled this off. And I'm So now I think everything is set up perfectly. Now it's just a matter of making sure we have good weather tonight for the dinner, and we have warm coffee, and then the rest is... Uh, up to the next speakers. Welcome to the user group meeting. This is the eighth one. Um, I don't think there's a lot of logistics. Th Thomas, uh, if you have any questions about organizational issues, everybody who has, who actually wears a badge, not like me, everybody should be wearing a badge and has an orange stripe. Those are the NIMEs. Ask them questions. Try not to ask me any logistical questions. I don't know that. Anyway, um, what else is to, to say? Please tweet hashtag NIME if you have anything to tweet about. And let's get started. So what I wanted to do today, I wanted to spend about 20 minutes giving you a bit of a sort of a context about what we have done in the past and how we see NIME fitting into the advanced analytics world. So I'll look a bit back, kind of the things we have done in the past couple of years, what's currently going on, and then I'll dare the usual peak in the future. And that's obviously a very biased peak in the future. That's my view. May not necessarily correlate with yours, but I'd be actually very curious to have discussions over the course of the next two days to see how that, how that syncs or doesn't sync with your views. Um, and then I'll talk a bit about, give you just a bit of highlights of what happened at NIME in the, in the past year. One very early highlight, 2015. I'll also mention that. Um, these are not my slides. And then I'll we'll just briefly talk about the UGM, what's, what's ahead of us for the next couple of days. Um, good. Let's do that. Advanced analytics, the first thing is, of course, it's not analytics anymore. Now we have to call what we do advanced analytics because the visualization people grab the term analytics. And when you now talk to people that claim they do analytics, all they do is colorful graphics. So what we really do is advanced analytics. What's up next? Um, in my view, analytics is really something it's about. This is very confusing. It's about data, methods, um, and people, right? It's about what type of data you're analyzing, what kind of data pop starts popping up in your environment that you need to analyze, that you want to analyze, what kind of methods you're using for that, and then in the end, which people are actually doing the analysis and which people are using the analysis, and that sort of gap is broadening further and further. Let's start with data. We all know, have done, we started dealing with uh, very simple data sets, a couple of numbers, a couple of strings, nothing dramatic. Um, then a couple of years ago, network analytics started popping up. Tobias Kötter is the man behind the network extensions in NIME, added a lot of cool stuff there, visualization, but also graph analysis here is popping up very nicely. Um, text mining is, of course, a big thing we'll be hearing. I think I stole that from Kathy's talk later today about what Slav got to do with it when she analyzes dating sites. Um, and then, of course, more application-specific data, like sequencing data from, from bioinformatics. And being with NIME and having been with NIME from the beginning, I should not forget to mention molecules, right? That really sort of drove, drove uh, NIME initially. Ten years ago, I would have not known what that is. Now I actually do, Greg, but I had to look it up. <laughs> um, so what's, what are current trends? Current trends is big data. Everybody talks about big data. We don't really know what that means. And the different interpretations, it's not just about massive amounts of data, but it's also about very heterogeneous data or very complex data to analyze. And a lot of that is around the Internet of Things, right? I mean, Internet of Things can mean many things. It can just mean variables. Who here has a smartwatch? Hold up your arm. OK, Google, buy Rosaria's book. No? We'll see if that works. Rosaria, you see if your sales go up. Um, and then, of course, all of the social media data that we have coming in from Twitter and other things. And then, of course, Internet of Things is for Industry 4.7 or 4.0 or whatever they call it. There's a lot of stuff going on in devices, right? And one of the announcements that I'm going to sort of in a way officially make later, we're now collaborating with Bosch and Bosch Software Innovations. They're back there at the booth. They're actually embedding NIME for advanced analytics into their Internet of Things suite. So that's sort of the current trend seems to be just more data. Where is that going in the future? I think we're going to have bigger problems. We're going to have data that's so big that we can't even store that. So for me, in a way, Hadoop is just sort of a stop 
on the way to having to admit to yourself, you know what, even in Hadoop, I can't just store everything. I need to do some smart filtering. And the funny thing is there are people out there that have been doing that for ages, right? People in physics know how to do that very well, right? When you look at particle colliders, they store a percent of the data. They're very smart at throwing away most of the data before it even touches their storage devices. Um, I think even faster data is also going to be interesting where you have so much data coming in at such a speed that you can't possibly really look at every item as well. So the streaming and predictive analytics will also become very interesting on that space. Seriously, heterogeneous data, I think right now what's happening is still very uniform data. It's different types of data, but it's mostly about the same domain. Really crossing domains, combining data from very, very different fields is something that's still very, very new. And tons of other data sources will be popping up that we don't even know what they're going to look like. Um, What's the method space? How did we try to tackle this type of data in the past? We have the usual things, right? There are null networks, there were naive base, the decision trees, that's sort of all the stuff that we learned and used 10 years ago. Now everybody's using support vector machines, going from low dimensional spaces into much higher dimensional spaces, use decision forests, trying to build ensembles of models that predict much better. Greg loves decision forests. And of course, the what recently popped up deep neural networks. For me, this is just more. It's the same stuff, but we are just throwing more compute power at it to build bigger neural networks. I remember 20 years ago when we were doing speech recognition at Carnegie Mellon, we trained tiny, tiny networks and used all of the Spark stations that were sitting around in the department to train these little networks. Now we have GPUs, we can train even bigger networks, but we're not actually doing fundamentally different stuff. It's still the same type of method here, just throwing the bigger networks. And random forest, same idea, right? You're still building decision trees in the end, but you're just building many, many of those. You're just boosting the decision trees. It's just ensemble learning. And this is also sort of an idea. I mean, it's mathematically much more sound, but you're just going into a much higher dimensional space, and there you're building a very, very simple model. Where's that going? Um, that's a very personal view. That's the type of stuff that I do with my academic head on. I personally think we are going to, we need to really revisit what the goal originally was. The goal was not to paralyze or speed up a heuristic algorithm because the heuristic was only developed and invented because we didn't have the compute power and we didn't have enough data. Now we have tons of compute power, very distributed, so we need to find new ways to use that distributed compute power to find better models, right? I think there's a lot of promise in that area. And then something we did in the frame of a European project, which we call dissociative knowledge discovery, is trying to find patterns that reveal connections between very disparate domains. Healthcare on one side, financial things. Finding patterns that pop up somewhere else. And there's some, there are a couple of interesting articles in there. And no, I don't, I'm not trying to sell this to you. This is open access at Springer, so you can read that for free. But else, I don't know, there's a lot of cool stuff going on. And one of the things why last year I talked about the open platform, why NIME is an open platform is so important, we are not going to do all of that stuff. It's going to pop up in other research groups around the world. They are going to invent new cool methods. And being able to integrate those and use those from within NIME, I think, is one of the very powerful features of an open platform. People, the last part, it started off being data analysts sitting in a corner. They were doing whatever scripting thingies, you threw your question over the ball, and two days later an answer came back, and that was it. It wasn't interactive, it wasn't very collaborative in a way. You didn't really know what kind of black magic that person was using, but that's how it worked like 10 years ago. Um, now, so that was really the area of statistics and a bit of machine learning touching that area. Where we now, we don't call it data analyst anymore, now it's called data scientist just sounds, I mean, it's the usual rebranding buzzing. It's more data mining, it's a bit more visual exploration. So instead of having a hypothesis that you test, it's more the idea is trying to find something that you can test. So through explorative processes, coming up with interesting new questions that you may want to answer with the data that you have. Where's that going in the future? Again, that's the, the analytics, the open platform idea. You really need sort of a backbone that doesn't claim I'm going to solve all of your problems for you. It's a proprietary platform and, hey, if you have new data, you need to wait for me to sell you the connector to that new data, but you need an open platform where that data provider can add a connector to the data. Or a new tool pops up and the tool provider can add that. And your legacy software is also something that you can use on the side and just call out to that. There's a lot of IP already invested in some of that stuff you're not going to replace. You want to keep using that. Legacy tools, other things as well. So that's also something you want to be able to 
do use what you did there, the, the analytics processes, the workflows that you built, and deploy those to others, to more casual analysts. They use that maybe as a template to more business user type people, or, and right now there's this other buzzword of analytics for the masses. We'll see what that means, what I think that means in a second. Um, okay, so let's look at what NIME did in these spaces, right? On the data front in 2014, we added a couple of social media connectors. We're working on those. Patrick, I think, is going to mention that. A lot of the more details about what I'm going to mention now in the next couple of slides will be discussed in the following talks about what's new in NIME and what's cooking in labs. And of course, we have a lot of big data connectors. You can connect to Hive, to Impala. We have HDFS connections, Vertica connectors. Those nodes are certified by Cloudera and Hortonworks, so you know it actually works with those, uh, with those distributions. And uh, back there, we have Parstream. There's also a high-performance analytics platform that you can embed and call out from NIME as well. Um, what are we working on? Of course, even we, we're working on throwing even more data into that blender. We have JSON nodes. You may have noticed those popping up. It's sort of kind of clear where that's going. Obviously, we're working on MongoDB connectors, CouchDB connectors. Alex will be talking about that a bit more in, in the next session. Um, where are we on the tool front? Um, the tool front is one thing, is the type of stuff that we keep adding to NIME, for instance, a Python integration, but of course also our partners that keep adding to, the, uh, to NIME, adding functionality to NIME. Those are logos of companies that are just here, but there are many more that are adding their stuff to NIME. Right? Maybe worth mentioning one, Schrödinger, our oldest partner, they started adding their tools to NIME before NIME was even released. I still don't know how they found out that NIME existed before it was released, but that's a different problem. Um, and then the Python integration, Patrick will talk about that a bit later, allows you to also embed these types of tools, right? So we have a, last year we talked a lot more about the R integration, the interactive R integration, so the same concept now also applies. You have a couple of, to Python, you have a couple of nodes that allow you to call out Python and embed that as part of your NIME workflow. And then NIME wouldn't be NIME without all of our community contributions. There's tons of stuff in here. If you go to the community nodes, you install everything. Lots of things for next generation sequence analysis, um, HCS for text mining, REST nodes, some, something very specific. Sometimes it's a huge library of really cool nodes. I mean, Eli Lilly alone, the Elbert extensions is probably 100 nodes or so. And of the partners of all of these community contributions, a number of those are are here, Scenix provided the REST nodes, Chemaxon is providing free extensions for, for chemistry, structural rendering, LI Lilly, Berlin, Infocom, the MP, Dresden. We actually have two different groups in Dresden contributing, Novartis with RD Kit, and the ones with the star uh, will be presenting some of that stuff as part of the workshops on Friday, so that's also worth going to. Um, more tools seamlessly integrated. This is something Tobias will be briefly talking about. Some of you may have already seen that using the Hive connector, you can, of course, do a lot of pre-processing right on Hadoop, but model that as part of NIME. You'll see later how that works. And right now, cooking in our labs are, is an MLlib integration, so you can also build models on Hadoop. And, of course, we're also working on using Spark and integrating that as part of the NIME workflow as well. Good. Where are we today in terms of people, right? If you look at what, what people are doing with NIME, we are sort of, we can cater to the coding wizards, to the people that, those analysts in the corner that I mentioned before that had really hard time deploying their stuff to others or having others reuse that, that weren't firm in that programming language, we can embed that into the NIME workflow, right? So we have scripting integrations, most notably for Python R, and in a way also for SQL, right? Some of these database nodes, essentially under the hood, you're building SQL, you're programming SQL without ever writing a single line of code. Um, then if you the workflow artists, right? People that build complex workflows from scratch that others may just run or use as a template to go, go from there. They just name stuff. That's sort of the, the natural name user. Um, and then we have what we call casual users. Those are people that may not necessarily be able to build a workflow from scratch, but they can use a workflow as a template, adapt it to their own nodes, add some data sources, and rerun that kind of analysis. And the ability of NIME sort of to collapse things, hierarchically organize it, abstract from things, and hide a lot of complex functionality in one of these nodes, and maybe even expose some of the parameters using QuickForms nodes to the outside, is actually very powerful. So you can really put a lot of complex functionality. This one, for instance, calls out to Python and calls out to R, not because it has to, but because we can. And then when, once you collapse that into this little meta node, all you see is a couple of parameters that the 
programmer of that workflow and those snippets decided this is the knobs that I want my users to turn, to have access to. So you can expose fairly complex functionality to others in a very, very simple way. And this is sort of the story that we had until last year, right? And it stops with the business analysts, and they don't want to see a workflow. They should probably not see a workflow necessarily. They can look at reports that we are generating via our BERT integration, or they may be integrating, looking at some of the integrations through, for instance, with Tipco Spotfire sitting back there, right? You can call out to Nine workflows without ever seeing the Nine workflow. Or you could use the Nine web portal for what I call more like a supervised analytics, right? You can specify a couple of parameters and then run the workflow and the workflow generates something without you necessarily seeing the workflow. I think this is, it shouldn't stop here. What does analytics for the masses really mean? Analytics for the masses shouldn't just mean you can give me three parameters and I run an analytics process or I'm running an analytics process and then I can play with the data afterwards. It needs to be much more interactive in a way, right? So what you really want, you want to be able to also cater to what we call analytics users, right? That's the analytics for the masses. They don't really know, they aren't a data scientist, they don't really know what kind of algorithms run underneath the hood. So you need to very carefully expose to them the types of things they can do. But it's not just give me a couple of parameters and off you go, but it needs to be much more interactive. So what we call that is sort of there's this term guided analytics. And there's another connotation to guided analytics, and I'm explicitly not talking about that one. This is not about give me any data that you have, and magically I'm going to cook up some analytics process that finds the one insight that you're interested in. That, I think, is either impossible or far out in the future, right? This is about something I say for a particular type of data, I'm going to have an interactive, I can guide you through an analytics workflow and allow you some interactions. You can zoom into a subset of the data, or a couple of patterns that you find interesting, rerun that, and that then finally generates the output, right? So it's more of the ability to take an analytical workflow that maybe reaches all the way down to R or Python and deploy that to people at just the right level of abstraction and with the right amount of interaction that they can adjust and control what they need to control. That, I think, is really analytics for the masses. Out of the sudden, you can give powerful analytics to people that don't necessarily have all of the data science background. So that's what we're working on, and I think maybe from time to time, thinking about that when you see some of the things that we're working on that we have done in the past year or that we're going to do in the next year, sort of puts maybe in context why interactive JavaScript use are so important for our development. Good, so we have everything from coding wizards all the way to the analytic users, right? Scripting integrations to be able to embed these things, the workflow, sort of the, the nine core templates, shared meta notes that allow you to expose some of those things to people who aren't quite as firm with nine. Business analysts get the reports, web portal, open APIs to be able to embed that analytics into other, and other frameworks and the guided analytics. That's something we're working on for the future development. And if you remember my talk last year, my opening last year, I talked about these five pillars of an open platform. This guided analytics actually fits very, very nicely into the agility requirement, right? Intuitive exploration of alternatives. That's what you really need to give people. Right, the rest is part of the open platform anyway. Good. With that, let's talk a bit more concretely what happened last year. Our 2014 highlights, there are many, 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 so I did a bit of cherry picking here. Um, some of you may have noticed that we have a new logo. We rebranded a bit that had to do with the fact that our website was very technical. So now it's just technical. So we took that also as an as a as a reason to look at our logo and maybe revamp a bit. So this is the new like logo and we have a tagline open for innovation. And the tagline sort of took us a while to come up with that one. How do you describe what we really do? You can of course talk about it's an open analytics platform. But why is it open and what does it enable you to do? So it's the open platform but that also opens you up for innovation. That's sort of the thing behind that. The idea behind that, so navigating complex data and that only an open platform can bring. And I strongly be still believe into that. Also looking at a lot of the other tools out there, proprietary platforms, locking you in into a proprietary pr platform limits your choices in what kind of data you can analyze with what kind of tools and what you do with that data. So I think that's really a strong, strong plus. Nime alone, without any of the community partner contributions, is just yet another analytics tool. But with the open API on all of these partner and community contributions, that's what really makes it more powerful than everybody else out there. So check out our new website. If you don't find what you're looking for, let us know. If you have suggestions, also let us know. This is work in progress. 
So that's new. We have obviously many releases in 2014. We had two releases of the Nyman Analytics platform, many, many new nodes, a couple of smaller and bigger enhancements. Bernd will be talking about that with some of the developers. We'll present that in the next session. And we have a couple of commercial tools that we released around the pro productivity tools. And back there at the Nyme table, you can get demos of some of those. We have big data extensions. Those are really, in a way, it's a distribution that just makes your life easier, right? You can still use the open source connectors to connect to Hadoop and do all of that stuff, but then you need to pick the right drivers and libraries so that it actually works with Cloud AR, which is actually pretty painful. So the big data extensions allow, they are certified against certain versions of Cloud AR distributions and Hortonworks distributions, you just know it works out of the box. Right, we have lighter versions, easier to install versions of our server and the web portal, and tons of new features also in the NIME server, and Torsten and Thomas will be talking about that later. Um, this one I already mentioned, we have an IoT partnership with, with Bosch Software Innovations. Honestly, I used to work for Bosch when I was a kid. I, was, I lived in Reutlingen and I worked at Rommelsbach at Bosch. Bosch always struck me as a super conservative German company, very boring. They aren't at all. I was last week, I was at Bosch Connected World. It was a really, really cool, super interesting, super interesting event. So we are super happy to work with Bosch on that. A um, couple other things, we have new people on board. We now have in Mountain View, last year I mentioned that we have an office in San Francisco. Jay Diamond is our new VP for business development. Jay, Jay back there, you'll see him, he's the bald guy. <laughs> um, Aaron Hart, formerly known as Aaron Hart in Zurich, is now Aaron Hart in the Mountain View. We shipped him off back to his homelands. He actually wanted to go back, but we have a replacement for him coming into Zurich. Um, in Berlin, we brought on board Tobias Kötter who has been with Nime for many years, but decided to go for a postdoc and do something else for a while, over there in this beautiful purple shirt. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we have two more people joining us very soon. We have a VP sales joining us. And I can't tell you who it is. I can tell you he's in the audience, and I'll promise you, you won't recognize him as a salesperson. He's a really nice guy. He's a really smart guy and he fits with Nime very, very well. So don't be scared, we're not going to start calling you every minute if you wouldn't want to buy a Nime book or something, not going to happen. And we are going to have a new application scientist joining us as well, sort of replacing Aaron Hart. Um, we are hiring, we're looking for people, so if you know someone or you are looking for a good job, uh, if you're looking for a big data engineer, looking for someone who experienced Java, Hadoop, Spark to help us with the big data extensions, big data development. We're looking for someone who can help us on the web server, web front end uh, front, and also for someone who actually finally takes all of the finances off Peter's hands, who is that turned to kind of sort of into a full-time job for him. And he'd rather write new file readers, right? <laughs> Some of you may remember this one. I sort of snuck in a draft of the Garden Report last year uh, that wasn't released last year at the time of the UGM. Gardner just released the report for 2015, and this is what the magic quadrant looks this year. We moved up a bit in terms of ability to execute. I can't claim that I truly fully understand how this Gardner stuff works, but we are very happy with where we are. Um, and one of the things that Gardner writes in their report, and that's something we keep being proud of, we have very happy users. And on it, read the report if you get free access to it. It doesn't say that about all the other companies in that space. Good. So, what are we going to do the next couple of days? The user group meeting, you all have the agenda. One thing worth highlighting, we, last year we started handing out stars for people who keep coming back. And the one person who keeps coming back, and probably by now, that alone should have given you a million mile, mile status with whatever airline you're choosing, is Taka. He's the one who came eight times to our user group meeting. Welcome back, Taka. <clears throat> we have a couple of people, too, and Torsten didn't come back. That's why Taka is now all alone at the top. Greg is here, Torsten didn't come, they came to seven. We have six people, Jean-Christophe. Volker is starting to drop. Tell that to Volker, Jean-Christophe. Eh? He's, he's not going to keep, keep having the star. Um, the five-star club, both of those aren't coming, but I know Jürgen is wanted to come, was really regretting, couldn't come. And we have uh, actually a number of people who are now part of the five-star club. And you'll notice all of those guys, they have a little golden star on their, on their badge. 
Welcome to that. Couple of numbers we have uh, now. It's I think 179 attendees that came. That was actually very, one of the surprises. We were a bit worried, right? Going to Berlin, you lose local people. They don't want to travel all the way to Berlin. But actually, a lot of the people did come. The low, sort of the local ones from the Zurich neighborhood did come, and a lot of new people are coming. So our UGM is growing, no matter where we do that. That's pretty cool. Um, 207 meters above Berlin, that's where our dinner is. There are instructions how to get there. It's, you can either walk. Thomas is going to lead the walking group, but, or there's a couple other people who are going to... It's two stops with the S-Bahn, so it's about two kilometers, a mile and a half or so. It's a nice walk if the day stays like this. And keep your fingers crossed, we need clear skies, right? Otherwise, we're just going to be up there. I remember one time I was in Chicago and it went up to this... What's the Sears Tower? And I actually got a discount. It was a zero visibility discount. So you got 50% off, so let's, let's hope that doesn't happen. We have nine workshops on Friday morning. Um, we haven't allocated those, so please do return this sheet so we know which workshop you want to attend. You can't attend more than two, so you can check more than two, but that's not really going to help us much. And then we'll try to allocate those in such a way that you hopefully can attend the two that you want to attend. And we'll, we can run one or two twice, but that's about it. And Dean already agreed to running his twice. I have a feeling that many people will want to hear him again. Um, we have, and that was also very impressive, we have one, nine people coming from Birmingham, Ingelheim. Very impressive. Thank you, guys. I mean, Ber actually, Biberach is much closer to Zurich. You used to drive. Now people flew in or took the train or whatever. Thank you for coming. We take that as a very big sign of um, things, uh, of... of Commitment tonight, I guess. Thanks. Um, and Niels, for you, nine people is, I guess, that's the maximum you could fit in your car. There's a, a bus rental company for next year's UGM. <laughs> maybe you can bring a couple more colleagues. If you, maybe you want to scribble down that number. Good. <laughs> so what's up next? This is almost over. Um, Bernd is going to talk about the, he's going to give the usual what's new, he's going to pull a lot of people on stage talking about various things that we've been working on in the past year. Thomas will lead the what's cooking in Nime, sort of giving you a bit of a peek what's going to come out in the next couple of years. This year we try to group talks a bit by topic, it's fairly random assignment, but we try to put things together that could potentially fit together, so hopefully you'll enjoy that. Um, the day today will conclude with our usual Phil show about a new topic. He usually has a very, very good sense for what's going to become hot in the future. So it's between being about anomaly detection and then the dinner. So we won't have much time after this one to head over to the dinner because we need to all sort of squeeze people through the elevator. Are there even stairs, Tobias? They can take the stairs? <laughs> no stairs? Okay, so we need to just shuffle everybody up with the elevator. So it's going to be a bit of a logistic challenge, but we'll, I think we'll figure that out. Um, then tomorrow we'll start with health and bunnies, a bit more life science oriented session in the morning. After the morning break, we have a huge session with lots of small spotlight presentations. Thomas introduced for the first time this year the poster session, so we'll also have posters where you can keep talking about some of the uh, community contributions or some of the other work that's been going on with NIME. So this is going to be very interesting but also very dense. And then in the afternoon, we talk, have talks about a bit more corporate NIME usage and a life science session. And then at the very end, we have as a little highlight to conclude that day, we ask Dean to come back and he came back. Thank you, Dean, for coming back again. Um, everybody loved him last year. So, I mean, you actually have very high standards to live up to. Oh. You, you put the bar high last year. <laughs> So this will be cool, and then we'll have a bit of a networking uproar here just for people to hang out a bit and have drinks and finger food. We have what Berliner Bulette and Currywurst, right? So local Berlin food. And then on Friday, the workshops in the morning, we, as I said, two sessions, and we'll try to allocate those, those work, workshops in such a way that you can attend as many as, as possible. Okay, that's all I wanted to say to get things started. We'll hopefully see you again in 2016, since you guys did such a great job this year. You can just do it again. Um, spring 2016, again in Berlin. Here's another little challenge. That time we want to have dinner on top of the Reichstag at Restaurant Käfer. So you make reservation early. We'll send out an email once the dates are confirmed. We'll try to avoid all the usual, the Fasnachts and the Carnivals and the ACSs and whatever else there's out there, plus all of the school vacations, and try to find, get this location and the restaurant Käfer. But Tobias and Killian are going to figure it out. I'm not worried. And 
We'll see you in fall. Where? In the San Francisco Bay Area, Aaron and Jay have agreed to organize a West Coast user group meeting there as well. Thank you very much. Enjoy the next three days.